I welcome everyone to the final session of the practitioner track. Uh, I want to introduce our speaker today. I met Jonathan Carelsa in 2006 at an IBF conference in Orlando. At that time, he was cutting his teeth on supply chain planning and demand planning at a Japanese tire manufacturer. Then in 2011, he founded his current company, North Find Management. Jonathan studied economics at the University of Western Ontario before going to University of British Columbia for law. He graduated from the MIT School of, uh, Sloan School of Management in 2008. He's a member of the Harvard Business Review Advisory Council. He has a podcast on Forbes Radio that's featured Paul Goodwin and Spiros Macrodakis and others. At Northfine, their cornerstone practices are SNLP and IBP and operations management. However, they're increasingly leading the way in research and practice with the application of behavioral science to operational judgment, including forecasting. Jonathan's new book, Histories of the Future, is an Amazon bestseller and a great read, so I highly recommend it. With that, welcome, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, as always, for the uh, introduction that makes me wonder if there's someone else who's supposed to be taking my spot. Um, I'm going to begin with a story. I was uh, very much intending to be with you in person. Um, and in fact, uh, my flight which was departing at 10.45 p.m. last Friday. Um, ha had you asked me at 6.30 p.m. if I would be in Oxford, I would have said with a 99% certainty, yes, I will be there. Uh, however, as is increasingly the case in these uh, uncertain times, um, I won't say fate, I would call it more politics intervened. Uh, and uh, because of Canada's still draconian COVID exposure laws, despite the fact that I have a negative test, I was denied boarding because of close contact with two people who did have COVID. Um, so the, the lesson there I think is, is twofold. First, don't trust me for estimations. Um, and, and secondly, the forecast will always be wrong. On top of that, Mike, I don't know if you saw my email this morning. Uh, I'm guessing you didn't because there was no panicked follow-up. Uh, when I got up this morning, uh, which in Canada is a few hours ago, um, the power was out. So uh, I scrambled to find a backup battery pack for my phone, which I intended to use to hotspot my laptop um, so I'd be able to dial in remotely. However, um, the power came on about 20 minutes ago, so here I am. Um, the, the difficulties of my travel apart, um, the role of judgment in forecasting is I think an increasingly important one. It's always been important, but I think it's often been overlooked. Um, and, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think uh, one of the reasons is um, when I first, like, like Mike said, began cutting my teeth in forecasting, I had this uh, sense, uh, based on a, a lot of research that's been established, um, Paul Goodwin in, in particular has done a lot of this work, um, that people are just not very good at judgment. Um, and when I get into uh, my, my presentation in a few moments, uh, we'll see also the work that uh, Kahneman and Tversky did, and later Richard Thaler and those who followed, uh, all agrees we're just not as sharp as we think we are. So I think there's been a sense for a long time in forecasting that we should stay away from human judgment wherever we can, because uh, statistics is unbiased. Statistics is uh, something um, more measurable and, and hence more tangible. And given the, the advances that we've seen over the last few decades, um, there's, there's a lot of promise there. So rightfully, um, new branches of application to forecasting like machine learning, and I call it new because although it, it by no means is, it's, it's been getting the much more attention of late. Um, additional uh, time series methods, um, ways of combining these, these methods together 
get a lot of attention. And uh, virtually every software company uh, is, is telling you that their solutions are super powered with AI and ML. So um, you don't have to worry about your forecast anymore. It's going to be fantastic. And, and, and I say that somewhat flippantly, but, but again, I want to be very clear. I'm a strong proponent of, of using statistics and uh, machine learning and, and whatever other tools we have at our disposal, wherever it makes sense. The reason that I think the conversation on judgment is particularly important is because although humans are really bad at it, um, there are particular circumstances where we need to use it. And more importantly, there are a lot of circumstances where we don't think we're using it, but we're still using it. And I guess it's because of the kind of circuitous path that I took to forecasting, um, and, and, and Mike gave you a little bit of a background on that in, in his kind introduction, um, that I, I'm not a normal uh, forecast practitioner. Um, forecasting for me was always a management process. It was one of a number of tools that I had at my disposal to, to build operational and ultimately corporate strategy on. So when forecasting couldn't give me what I needed, that was fine. I turned to other things. And I never really had the idea that my supply chain strategy or my operational strategy or my financial strategy needed to be predicated on, on the need for an excellent forecast. Um, my feeling was always, it just wasn't possible. So coming to forecasting from the standpoint of, of looking at it as a management process rather than a means in and of itself or a means unto to its own end means that I accepted from the outset that the forecast was always going to be wrong, that the forecast was one in a, in a, in a multitude of different tools I could use. And if that there were ways that I could improve my forecast without making too significant investment of, of money or time, or more importantly, at least that the investment of money and time would be offset by an incremental improvement in my EBITDA, that this is something I'm interested in, but that I wasn't necessarily interested in trying to milk every last ounce of accuracy out of a data set, especially because the landscape can change relatively quickly. Which brings me to judgment. There are many cases where using time series methods is going to yield fantastically stable signals from which operations can execute a manufacturing strategy and ultimately balance the need to delight your customers and delight your shareholders. But when the landscape changes, as it has during COVID, at least temporarily, those historic signals are no longer going to be as useful. And if you're in an organization that has taken a binary approach to forecasting, which is to say, you're only looking at statistics or you're only looking at judgment, you're going to find yourself woefully exposed when these situations change. So I look at judgment as a risk management uh, policy in forecasting, having the, capa the capability to incorporate judgment into a forecast is there not as a, as a basis for forecasting all the time, but as a fail safe in situations where those other methods are no longer going to be as predictive. But the major caveat is, like I said, we're really bad at judgment. So how do we leverage the benefit of human insight in these times of massive change without at the same time undermining the validity or the benefit of the forecast because of all the flaws of human judgment. And that's what in the next 30 or 35 minutes uh, I intend to do. So I'll be giving uh, what is a very crash course in the difference between the neoclassical approach to decision-making versus behavioral science how this applies to judgment and forecasting, and ultimately what are some of the mitigation strategies that we can use to, to counter the, the uh, effect of these frailties in human judgment. Um, Mike or someone, uh, just because we didn't test this beforehand, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? I can see it. Okay, perfect. Right, so I've given as usual uh, a, a longer than necessary introduction so I can skip through that slide. Um, 
it's uh, for half an hour, a rather ambitious agenda. Um, I'll, I'll try to go through it uh, not too quickly to, uh, to, to ensure that no one has actually grasped anything, but quickly enough that we have time to, uh, to jump into questions. And I should also say, if there are questions in the meantime, um, I'm completely fine with uh, anyone jumping in with the uh, virtual hand raise function or in the uh, in the meeting room uh, shouting out the question. I can I can deal with them as they come up. That's fine. All right. So to begin with, um, I have a couple of what my colleague John Burkhart would call thought examples around the effect of the the heuristic processes at play in human judgment. This works much better in person, and, and believe me, I wish I was there to do it, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to play along given the current circumstances. So in, in this case, we've got um, a data set showing us orders for a particular product, what the product is in this case doesn't matter, over the course of uh, about a year and a half. And uh, all I'm gonna tell you is the, the vertical axis is the volume, the horizontal axis is the time, I'm not going to tell you who the customer is. I'm not going to tell you what the product is. And were we in person, I would ask all of those of you who believe that uh, demand is going to increase over the next six months to raise your hand. And don't do it now because I can't see you. Um, and I would ask those of you who think demand is going to fall over the next six months to raise your hand. And then there will be some of you who are stoically holding out. Um, and some of you who say it's flat, and I will take a tally of that. We'll just put that to the side. Um, historically, this is not the first time I've, I've shared this data set. I can say that at this point, um, it's a pretty even spread between people who think it's going up, it's going down, or it's going flat. Um, another quick thought example, uh, and, and this one <laughs> I should point out, although uh, given my reason for not being able to uh, fly and, and, and given the reality of the last couple of years, this might seem a little insensitive. I wanna point out uh, this example is not mine. This comes directly from Kahneman and Tversky's work in 1973. So they had no idea COVID was gonna be happening during this presentation. Um, this airborne disease has nothing to do with COVID. So this is an, this is an imagined um, disease. It's going to kill 600 people. We're not going to debate the, the, the science of exactly how we know that. Just suffice to say we know. And we've got two alternative programs to combat the disease. In the first case, program A, we will save 200 people. In program B, there's a one-thirds probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no one will be saved. Now, recognizing the composition of the group that we've, we've got at this conference, uh, I'm guessing most of you have immediately come to the conclusion that probabilistically these are identical, and that is true. But you still can't deny the fact that there is an intuitive uh, comfort around one of these versus the other. Uh, and likewise, in, in cases C and D, where in case C, 400 people will die. And in case D, there's a one-thirds probability no one dies and a two-thirds probability everyone dies. Again, probabilistically identical, but they still feel different to us. And we'll talk about where that feeling comes from um, and, and what that means in practicality shortly. Final thought example before we jump into what are we talking about when we talk about behavioral science and judgment? Um, I'm gonna be showing you a data set and it depicts the history of customer orders for the Gulfstream G6. That's a long range uh, commuter jet. Um, additional background information, the sales team at Gulfstream has been telling us for the last nine months that demand is certain to increase because of new business contracts that they're going to land in China. Uh, in addition, for those of you who really want a holistic view of the, of the situation, uh, I can tell you that Gulfstream's monthly maximum airframe capacity for the G6 is 16 aircraft. Um, if we don't fill customer orders, there's a strong possibility that the rival manufacturer Beechcraft may win the business. Um, for those of you who really like uh, the stats, there's going to be a polynomial trend line attached. 
And I will ask the same question I asked earlier, do we think demand is going up or down or flat? Now, again, not being in person, this isn't quite as effective, but having done this enough times, I, I have a fair sense of, of how things would have shaken out. And, and what we see is typically, um, there's about two times as many people at this point who believe that the business is going to go up for a variety of reasons, but they think it's going up. Now, the reality is the underlying data set was stochastic. And, and we went as far as to ensure that we didn't accidentally have trend or seasonality. In it. There's nothing there. It's completely random. Um, and although this is an interesting story, none of this story really has any bearing on the data itself. Now, all of that should add up to the same results as we have in the first case. But having done a version of this test now over 800 times with different companies and, and hundreds and hundreds of professional demand planners, I can tell you that the typical result is that when we add a frame or a story to stochastic data, um, the way that people interpret that data becomes much, much different. And there's obviously very significant uh, implications for what that means when it comes to forecasting. Because although we love the idea of, of having very objective, uh, neutral interpretations of the data that we're looking to forecast, the reality is organizations are rife with both explicit and implicit directions and bias. So there are framing effects around all of the data that we're asked to interpret. Now, classical economics or neoclassical to be more accurate uh, versus behavioral economics is sort of the crux of where we're going to spend the next 20-ish, uh, 25 minutes. Understanding how taking a different view of how human judgment works can give us insights into how to make it more effective when we come into those situations where we need to leverage it in the forecasting process. The neoclassical approach to decision-making has been relatively uh, unchanged for about 300 years. Uh, the, the gentleman in the top left is Adam Smith, not George Washington. Um, and in 1776, most of you will know he wrote the Wealth of Nations, which was a, a seminal work in the development of what we now call economics. And basically the premise of, of much of his work is that when people are faced with clear value-based choices, they're gonna choose the, the, the option with the greatest value or utility to them. And this doesn't need to be expressed in terms of dollars, but that there is a utility that one can ascribe to each of these choices. and, and rational human actors will always choose the one that has the greatest benefit to them. Moving from that, prices are then set by the relationship between demand and supply. And in those cases, in those rare cases, when consumers act outside of this model, they're behaving irrationally. I always loved that as an economics student because it kind of meant uh, the model was never wrong. It just meant people were not doing what they were supposed to. Now, Several hundred years later, um, the psychology uh, researcher, Daniel Kahneman, uh, and his longtime collaborator, Amos Tversky, who was also uh, a psychologist, began by doing work with the Israeli Defense Force, uh, trying to look into um, ways to improve the selection framework that they were using to determine who, who was going to make a good soldier. And the, and the way it worked was basically a 45 minute interview that a panel of supposed experts would conduct to uh, new inductees and they would make a judgment call on, on whether or not this person was going to make a good soldier. Over a period of time, it became clear there was virtually no correlation between what they said was going to make a good soldier candidate and, and what that person could actually do in real life. And without getting too deeply into the details, what, what Kahneman found was he could distill down a lot of the recurring questions that came up in these 45 minute interviews to, to a basic set of four or five that according to his analysis were more predictive. And 
he was he was excited to present this to the IDF, uh, and unfortunately, they were not so receptive to hear it. Um, and, and this was one of his first uh, aha moments in what would become behavioral science. We've got something that is clearly going to help us get to the outcome we're looking for, but we're consciously, openly rejecting it. Why would that be? And, and, and the reality is, uh, as, as any of you who have studied negotiation will know, or psychology for that matter, the thing being negotiated or the thing being forecast or the thing being managed is, is very infrequently the thing actually being managed. There are all these other psychological drivers that come along with it. And, and this ultimately gave rise, I'm doing a, a very quick version of his history, to research in the early 1970s that started to dig into why do people do these things that run contrary to the predicted outcomes of neoclassical economics? It's, it's a slam dunk value proposition, and yet we're rejecting it. And what he found was a lot of economic decision making can be explained in terms of the psychologies surrounding and underlying the decision. And, and critically, a lot of the psychological drivers are unconscious. So even when we think we're being uh, objective and rational, we're looking at this objectivity and rationality through a lens, all of us, without exception. So when consumers make decisions that don't fit a neoclassical model, they're, they're not being irrational, they're being human. And getting back to my, my introductory comments, that this is important to forecasting for two reasons. Now, in organizations that already use judgment, the, the need to understand how to mitigate the effect of these unconscious biases is self-evident. We're already using judgment. There are, there are flaws in judgment, so let's do what we can to mitigate them. But it's for all those organizations that think they are not using judgments that I think this is even more important. We were working with Dell Technologies in 2019 and uh, just prior to the pandemic and, and, and Dell being a technology company um, has ample access to both computers and, uh, and data scientists. And, and they were moving towards trying to automate as, as far as they could the, the demand planning process because they, they, they basically wanted to get the underperformance of humans as well as the increased latency of human decision-making out of the process. And the early work in 2019 was promising. Um, the forecasts themselves were not phenomenally better than the, the old hybrid method, but there was virtually no latency. These, these forecasts could happen almost in real time. But then um, in the first few months of 2020, COVID struck. And suddenly the, the historic models no longer had any predictive power. I mean, even, even if you take out of, the, out of consideration the fact that work from home meant that demand for, for laptops and, and home computers hit a recently unprecedented level, even the individual uh, purchase behaviors and, uh, and preferences of consumers was changing the landscape for everybody. So even in an organization where the, as much effort as possible was being placed on automation and, and statistical forecasting, there was still in this unique circumstance uh, a need for judgment. And having removed judgment from the process, they no longer had an effective mechanism for integrating it. Um, so we ended up doing a, a pretty substantial uh, project with them over the course of 2020 to not only re-architect the process so there was an effective way of getting judgment back in, but also in, in measuring the unconscious biases of uh, their various demand planners globally, and then putting in place a, a mitigation framework and training program that would help um, Im improve the upside of, uh, of judgment and, and mitigate the downside. Beyond that, though, um, because we're not going to have enough time, I won't tell too many stories on this one, but there are many, many. A lot of organizations that think they're not using judgment are still using judgment all over the demand planning process. Uh, from, from how they manage their data preparation by 
what is defined as an outlier? How do we manage outliers? And, and, and all of you will have ideas about how, how to codify that, but every organization has its own ideas. Um, to when do we intervene on the stat forecast and, and when and where and why do we make statistical adjustments or parametric adjustments to the algorithms? Um, the integration of business intelligence obviously is judgmental. Um, the decision around what macroeconomic data to pull in or what macroeconomic data we don't think is going to be applicable has judgments. In the consensus and consolidation process, there are judgments. And even beyond that, the number of times we've been in organizations where they've made huge strides in forecasting, but customer service and inventory levels have not seen any change because, for instance, the plant doesn't believe what the forecasters are telling them for historic reasons or whatever else. There are judgments all over the all over the the end-to-end -end demand planning process. So no matter how uh, immune an organization or an individual thinks they are to the effects of unconscious bias, you are not. They're all over. So at the very least, it's necessary to begin to measure. And because unconscious biases and, and heuristics are baked in evolutionarily to the way our brains are structured, there's no getting around it. Humans are the only animal with the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex has the primary functions of abstract thought, which include weighing risk and reward and things like future consideration. These are things that are obviously pretty important to forecasters. What we share with a lot of other animals and more frequently use is the dopamine response center, which is the thing that allows us to make quick, uh, reflexive and often emotional decisions. Now, that's not a bad thing. There, there's a very strong reason evolutionarily that, that we have that dopamine response center. And, and, and candidly, it's the thing that kept us alive. If there's a, a tiger jumping out of the woods, we could stop and consider a number of different options and, and, and weigh up their relative merit, but then we'd be eaten by the tiger. Instead, we reflexively jump away, the same way that if we see a bus coming out of our peripheral vision, we reflexively jump away. This reflex or heuristic process has a huge benefit to us. We negotiate 30 to 35,000 uh, decisions every single day. And if we actually had to engage uh, objective judgment for every one of those decisions, we'd obviously be paralyzed. We wouldn't be able to move forward. But because the prefrontal cortex only finishes its development in the mid twenties, we've spent the first two and a half decades of our life using parts of the brain that are much better suited for, for re reflex and for shortcuts. And when it comes to business judgments or in particular forecasting, those reflexes and, and uh, heuristic processes don't serve us well. The problem is it's very difficult for us to be aware of when we're using one versus the other. And, and, and Kahneman has done a great job in thinking fast and slow for those of you who have read it, to try to break this into more easily understood discrete processes, which he calls system one and system two. Uh, these don't actually exist as discrete processes in our brain, but it, it's his way of explaining these two different thought processes that we have. We need them both. We, we, we definitely need the heuristic processes, the shortcuts that we've got to, to get through all the decisions we have to make. But when it comes to rational interpretations of, of data and decision-making, heuristic processes are usually where we get let down. And, I, and I'll talk about that, uh, some, some of the specific manifestations of those unconscious biases and heuristics in demand planning shortly. So the, the way that our, our, our minds are hardwired, first of all, to, to have a bias towards heuristic processes and that we only gain the capability for future consideration much later in our mental development has implications for our, our relationship with uh, quantitative analysis. Uh, we don't have enough time to get into a lot of the details. This one, Intertemporal Discounting, won a Nobel Prize uh, for Richard Thaler um, and, and essentially looked, looks at how really bad humans are at being able to judge the value of things in the future, which is kind of a big deal when it comes to forecasting. We, we underestimate the, the values or implications of risk 
the further into the future we go. And then that combined with uh, the flaws in the neoclassical approach to expected utility theory, where we have this idea that the human relationship between risk and reward is linear and symmetric. Although, as you can see in this slide, they've, there, are, there are multiple ways that neoclassicists try to jump through hoops to get to what Kahneman and Tversky ultimately found, which was that the human relationship between risk and reward is neither nonlinear or neither linear nor symmetric. It is uh, nonlinear and asymmetric. In other words, it hurts us much more to lose something than, than we feel good about gaining the equivalent thing. Um, interestingly, the, the further we go in either direction, uh, these relationships become asymptotic. So um, I believe it was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger who, who said, they're not right about money being everything or money, money making you happy. I feel no happier with $60 million than I did with 40 million. It's his roundabout way of getting to uh, sort of what Kahneman already predicted with prospect theory. After a certain point, every additional dollar kind of feels the same. Uh, and likewise on the, in the loss quadrant. However, in the domain in between, we, we are much, much more risk averse than we are uh, reward affine. And what this means in, in practical terms uh, can be seen time and time again. And I think uh, Paul Goodwin uh, did some fantastic work over the years in, in looking at the the practical application of human decisions or human adjustments to forecasts. And, and we see his work mirroring what Kahneman was predicting back in 73, which is humans love intervening on a forecast and materializing upside benefit, but we're 80% of the time not correct about that. And we infrequently or much less frequently want to intervene on a forecast or in integrate judgments that are going to bring a forecast down. We love the idea of upside, we bake that in. We wanna gamble with the idea of downside. That's, that's just how we're wired. So there are decades and decades now of research around the various heuristic processes that give rise to the D depending on whose count you want to use, literally hundreds of types of unconscious bias that impact our ability to make judgments. But they all sort of go back to the same three major categories. And I'll briefly talk about them before uh, jumping into some specific instances of unconscious bias that impact forecasters, and then talking about some mitigation strategies. So the first major heuristic process that Tversky and Kahneman identified was representativeness, which is basically the idea that if I see something that looks like something else I've seen, I can make a similar decision that led to the last successful outcome I had in that case. Now, this, this rests on obviously the assumption that the thing you're looking at is actually a representation of the other thing that's, that's in your memory banks, and that is often not the case. But this is one of the, the most frequently used heuristic processes because this is the thing that saves us from getting eaten by tigers. We don't think about what is the thing coming out of our peripheral vision towards us. We instinctively jump back. Um, we'll, we'll talk in, in, in several moments about specific instances of unconscious biases that arise from that particular heuristic type. Um, the next one is the availability heuristic which rests on the idea that if I can recall something uh, more quickly, or the, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is probably the thing that is most important in the decision I'm trying to make. So for instance, um, if you ask people um, about which, which way to, which cause of death would be more prevalent? Would it be uh, falling airplane parts or shark attacks? Um, most people are gonna say shark attacks because sharks get, um, for whatever reason, a, a, a lot of press uh, coverage, a, a lot of uh, coverage in, in uh, popular media, in films. Uh, in fact, there were six shark-related deaths last year uh, and something like 13 or 14 deaths from falling airplane parts. Um, hippopotamuses killed hundreds of people um, and dogs killed tens of thousands of people. But it, it's sharks that we get worried about because that's the thing that we hear about. And as a result, when you ask people, that's the thing 
that pops to their head and they think is more important. Plenty of examples like that. The final heuristic type is adjustments and anchoring. And this was, this was later work. Uh, this was their seven, 1979 work that was then followed on by uh, Richard Thaler in, in 82, um, which, which shows us that for whatever reason, when we're given an initial value or anchor, even if it's completely unrelated to the thing we're at being asked to evaluate, it can have an adjustment effect on our estimations. Um, great example of this is uh, research that they were doing in the 1970s, which was uh, asking uh, students or, or research subjects to estimate the number of um, African countries in uh, a particular UN organization, a, a obscure organization, not the UN, this particular uh, subgroup. Um, so they had a baseline of what, what the normal person would be able to estimate. And then in another um, experiment, they had in a separate room, uh, a rigged roulette wheel, which kept coming up with a number like 10 or 11. And then later in the day, putting this different set of students through the same exercise, and they all ended up gravitating towards that number. So it's, it's really insidious how the anchoring effect can actually take place. It doesn't even have to be related. But when we don't have a basis for judgment, our, our brain grasps for things it can anchor to to begin making its adjustments. And unfortunately, that's all too common in forecasting. So um, over the next few slides, uh, I'm going to show you several examples of prevalence rates of particular biases in global demand planners. And uh, this is based on, like I said, now over 800 people that we've talked to in a number of large organizations. Microsoft is, is the most uh, recent. Uh, so we got to speak with about 110 of their global demand planners in their Azure cloud computing space. Heineken, uh, we nearly had 200 demand planners. Um, Dell Technologies, and then a pile of other uh, smaller organizations. So a big enough data set that we're, we're fairly confident that directionally, at least, um, these biases are, are pointing to something that we need to be aware of as demand planners. So the first thing we looked at was overconfidence. Uh, this is something different than confident to be confidence, to be clear. This is uh, confidence that exceeds um, a, a justifiable certainty. So we're, we're more certain than we should be about being right. And, and what that means is we're, we're less likely to solicit the input of, of colleagues or other people. We're less likely to consider other uh, opinions or, or um, sources of data. And in particular, um, overconfidence can also deeper root some of the other bias types that we see. What we found was about three quarters of demand planners suffer from some degree of overconfidence. Now there's a, there's a spectrum, um, but three quarters of, of demand planners that we looked at falls somewhere uh, on the spectrum of overconfidence. Looking at that a step further in the, with respect to the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, which predicts that the more uh, experience we have, the less overconfidence we have, or conversely, the less experience we have, the more overconfident we, we will be, uh, we found the same thing. With demand planners uh, with less than a year of experience, these people were more certain than, than anyone else that they were right. Uh, and this gradually began to moderate as experience grows. Cluster illusion bias is, is a great example of the representativeness heuristic. So the, I, I think I recognize something I've seen before type of bias. Uh, cluster illusion bias is the idea that we can identify patterns where they don't exist. And uh, again, when we looked at global demand planners, nearly three quarters of them uh, wrongly identified patterns uh, in stochastic data. This is against uh, an average in the non-demand non planning community of around 58%. Again, obvious uh, implications for forecasting and demand planning, given that the job of more, most forecasters is literally to identify patterns. The framing effect I talked about a little bit at the outset. Um, this is the idea that uh, when data is presented in a more or less appealing way, it will change the way that people interpret that data. And we found that um, 
using various examples of unframed and framed data, people were three times more likely to draw a particular conclusion. In other words, not be in the I don't know category uh, in the framed examples versus uh, the, the raw data examples. And framing increased positive bias by nearly 300%. And I believe this is, yeah, this is the final, uh, this is the final bias type I want to talk about before briefly touching on what can we do about this in practice. Um, optimism and pessimism or persistent directional bias. Um, we found uh, more than half of, of global planners exhi exhibit some degree of positive bias and, and about 40% of them have strong positive bias. And, and what this again means in practicality is they're ascribing um, more positive or negative interpretation to data than the data set itself uh, would statistically support. Interestingly, those who have negative bias tend to be more strongly negatively biased. Um, I'm not sure why that would be apart from maybe if you've been a demand planner long enough, you've probably been disappointed enough times to finally give up the optimism and just go all the way the other direction. Um, and conversely, I suspect part of the reason we, we see the tendency towards positive bias is not only because there are organizational biases at play that reward uh, this type of behavior, um, but also in uh, selection bias. We, we may openly or unknowingly be biased towards selecting individuals for these roles who share the same positive outlooks that we want to see in the result of the forecasts. So um, I don't know if- uh, Jonathan, may I ask a question? Uh, who's who's that? You... It's Carolyn Allman, I'm virtual here. Oh, hey, Carolyn. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, if I can interrupt while you're on that topic, I wondered if in your research you found anything uh, different among um, demand planners for different industries. Yeah. Was there any? Yeah, we did. Change? Oh. Um, Thank you. So it's it's a, it's a great question, and part of the downside of um, having a data set of, I mean, 800 is a fairly robust data set. I mean, certainly. We're, we're quite confident that we can see statistically significant gaps between demand planners and non-demand planners. But when you start slicing and dicing, and we, we had some clients that um, I won't say who wanted to know, hey, can we see bias differences between men and women? Or can we see bias differences between uh, some of the different geographies we're in? Uh, and I'll get to your question in a moment, Carolyn, but it, it prompted this other uh, thought as well. The answer is yes, you can. Um, but I said, do you really want to know? Um, because if I tell you what the bias difference in your organization is between men and women, how are you going to action that? I mean, are you going to stop hiring men to be demand planners? How is that going to go from an HR standpoint? Um, what I can comfortably say is, in totality, uh, there is no difference in overall bias uh, prevalence between men and women. It appears there are different manifestations, but we'll get to why that isn't so important in several slides. But by industry, uh, certainly yes. Um, again, the caveat being we only have four or five industries in scope, and one CPG is heinously overrepresented. Um, but we, we certainly do see, uh, especially when it comes to uh, optimism and cluster illusion. A, a much stronger proclivity towards these type of biases in CPG than in some of the other ones. But, but again, I, I wanna caution that when you start slicing the data into these fine parts, the, the certainty becomes less. Um, Polly from Canaxis, I don't know if you're in the audience. Uh, however, we did exchange a couple of messages on, um, uh, on LinkedIn on, on my good friend and yours, George Box. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see we were both talking about him in the same way. So here's my George Box slide. Um, Jeff, I just saw your uh, question. I'll jump to that in a second. Um, George Box, uh, I, I'm sure most of you will know, um, one of the, the, the more important figures in the 20th century 
uh, of statistics um, and probably best known for saying uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And that's, that's typically where the quote ends. But the reality was that his quote actually goes on to emphasize two additional principles. He was saying this to say that since all models are wrong, aim for parsimony in model selection. And since all models are wrong, don't sweat most sized errors when there's tigers around. And this is kind of getting back to, to my earliest comments, which is I came to forecasting and still come to forecasting from a management standpoint where this is one tool in my, in my toolbox. This is for me a means to an end. And I'm not interested in, in the perfection of a forecast, and I'm not interested in spending any more time, effort, or money on a forecast than I can reasonably expect it will yield me in corollary financial benefit. And what that means is I'm going to use judgment judiciously. I'm going to use judgment because when it's the right time and place for it, it's an effective way to get more value from my process than I can otherwise get. But I'm not going to take any more time than I should with either statistics or judgment, especially given all these downsides of judgment, because it runs the risk of undermining the financial benefit of the process. So this has direct application to being aware of, of all these downsides of judgment, and, and all of us have them, all of us have these biases. Why would we ever use them? Well. We need to use them where the probability of success outweighs the risk. And the first test is you need to know something that your, your history doesn't. You need to know something that a computer can't do for you already. And, and secondly, if you know something, it needs to be sufficiently valuable to warrant intervention. So we shouldn't be wasting our time trying to make an adjustment to a forecast where even if we perfected it, the cost of intervention was greater than what the corollary benefit of the, of the improvement was. And finally, taking from uh, George Box, don't worry about the mice, focus on the tigers. So if, if we're making adjustments to a forecast well within our margin of error at a horizon where we know we're gonna be very wrong anyway, and I've seen this many, many times in demand review meetings with, with clients who, who have 52% forecast uh, accuracy at a, at a horizon of three months, arguing about one or two percentage points on a particular skew seven months out, this is literally a waste of time. It's certainly a waste of money. You're not that sharp at forecasting. Um, so when you choose your battles, make sure you're focusing on, on that part of your portfolio that has enough variability that the probability of judgments being beneficial is sufficiently large to warrant the intervention, but also the financial benefit, the contribution of those SKUs to your overall um, financial position is large enough that the probability pays off. Um, I'm going to assume because Mike Gilland is at the conference and because I believe there's already been an FVA presentation that I don't need to go through um, the how-to of FVA again. Um, but FVA for me is the first and most effective way of, of mitigating the effect of unconscious bias in forecasting. If you're only measuring forecast accuracy and bias, you don't have a, a useful enough metric to facilitate root cause and corrective action. Forecast value add allows you to get more granular so you can identify where the, where the sources of those biases are coming from. And I mean bias here in both the psychological as well as mathematical sense. But you need to be parsing your forecast process into its constituent parts to see where these biases are coming in and then identify them uh, and, and mitigate them. Again, uh, because, of, because of time, I'm not gonna go into an explanation of FEA. You have Mike Gilland at your disposal. Um, he can do a much better job of explaining it than I can. He's right there. Um, and if you don't get a chance to grab him, he has a lot of, and there are a lot of uh, FEA resources online. The next is decision trees. Um, there's, there's another bias type called choice diversification effect, which, everyone suffers from, even 
um, you know, high, highly paid stock tickers and uh, stock pickers and and uh, and hedge fund managers that that causes us to make decisions to try to add value by virtue of just making these different decisions. And, and we see this in, in uh, forecasting often as well. Uh, a demand planner is being paid or a forecast analyst is being paid to add value to the process. So they often feel compelled to tinker with things that aren't necessarily wrong just because they're getting paid to make things better. And the way we've seen a lot of organizations do a great job of mitigating this type of bias, uh, th this, this process-based bias, is to, to codify the interventions, begin by codifying the interventions and, and uh, diarizing the reason for intervention and then post-mortem analyzing what the, the benefit or, or not was of each of these interventions. And once you've been able to analyze in what cases you are probably going to be right versus less likely right, you can begin to derive decision trees that, first of all, will reduce latency from the process because people don't have to make decisions as frequently. But secondly, they give people the, the benefit of having uh, the ability to rely on an established thought process rather than having to reinvent the wheel each month. And this is precisely what Kahneman did back in the 1950s when he did his early work with the IDF. The, the caveat here is that there is a lot of work required to, um, to capture all of these judgments, codify them, and afterwards uh, calculate what the upside or downside of them was. But the payoff is a much better forecasting process and uh, ideally deriving the best benefit from judgment that you can. The final one um, is embracing diversity and, and trying to train out uh, or tra train around the, uh, ability, the uh, presence of biases. This slide arises from uh, a, a conversation we had with a client who was asking about uh, bias by gender, bias by ethnicity and bias by geography. And the question we asked then was, uh, why do you want to know this? Because what will you really do about it? I mean, there's, there's no way your HR, even if we found that, that certain genders or geographic regions were less biased than others, you're not going to get away with being able to hire only that type of person for your forecasting team. Moreover, if you did, this would be counterproductive because it's, it's precisely diversity of thought that helps to protect us against the kind of groupthink that leads to, for instance, um, catastrophes like the 86 Challenger disaster, where you had 18 really, really smart rocket scientists in the room who unfortunately were all the same gender, all the same backgrounds, and all looked at data and problems in the same way and all came to the same conclusion. Having different types of biases to me is much healthier than trying to select out biases at all. Because again, the, the bottom line is we all have them. There's no getting around the fact that we all have them. We have different types of biases to differing degrees, but having, having a mix of perspectives and having a mix of, of experiences helps to ensure that, especially in times of crisis, we're able to bring uh, a variety of different perspectives to bear to, to ensure that we haven't just all quickly jumped to the same conclusion, that we're all not um, subject to the same biases and not seeing an, a very obvious thing, again, as would have been the case in the 86 Challenger disaster, and, and being able to um, avoid a catastrophe. So I'm, I'm a little bit longer than I wanted to be. I wanna make sure I've got time for more questions and Jeff, I still see your question. Um, so very quickly, the, the four quick rules for reducing bias and improving performance. Don't touch what a computer should, uh, unless you know something specific about the future. Don't use what you don't measure. So in other words, if you aren't measuring the benefit of particular inputs or processes, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, practice increased mindfulness. Uh, Honestly, I'm not sure how to do this in a practical sense. I'm not particularly good at it myself, but uh, Kahneman does do a great job of explaining it in his book. And finally, 
Um, you can't fix what you haven't measured. So do identify and train against biases in your organization. So Jeff's question was, does neutral bias also extend to your five plus year group or after five years, do they migrate to extremes? So that's a great question, Jeff. Um, the reality is we, we have a mix. Um, and I, I'd love to say yes to one or the other because it'd be a, a really cool observation. But unfortunately, um, no. In general, we see uh, overconfidence reduce over time. I mean, it's still there. Um, but in terms of optimism or, or pessimism, that, that looks like it's a mixed bag regardless of experience. Interestingly, um, the, the recent work we did with Microsoft uh, looked at a number of specific job functions and um, data scientists in particular had a much, much different profile than the capacity planners and demand planners in the organization. And it, it's too early in our work there to say, is this the result of an organizational effect or is this the result of selection bias so that all their data planners or data scientists look the same? But the profile between those functional groups was much, much different. And it appeared the more experience they had, the more market the biases in that particular group became. We still have a, a few minutes left if there are any other questions. Oh, I should point out while anyone's thinking about questions. Um, if anyone's interested in uh, seeing their own biases, um, we have about a 40 minute uh, unconscious bias assay online on our website. Uh, that's northfind.com. You'll find it on, on the, the main page. Um, and if you, uh, if you wanna complete that, we're happy to send you back your results so you can see um, what the result of your bias uh, prevalence is in, in 20 different categories as well as how you stack up against everybody else. Thank you, Jonathan. And well, we've got time of maybe squeeze one question in here if anybody has. Yes, sir. Jonathan, I assume that was the, was that the last slide? It was. Oh, uh, perfect, perfect timing. Question. Thank you, and thank you for your talk, Jonathan. I'm David Comerford. I'm a behavioral economist at the University of Stirling. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about the use of prediction markets in organizations. That seems an opportunity to harness forecasts from subjective judges in a way that gives them an incentive to be accurate and to learn from their mistakes. Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. I think it's, an it, it's a really exciting and promising new um, field. Um, my colleague, Dr. John Burkhart, who's the, the behavioral scientist on my team, I'm not, I just leverage the stuff he does, um, has, has much more to say on the topic, but I will say um, lots of the, uh, I mean, you'll be aware of this, but for the benefit of, of those in the audience who aren't, um, organizations as disparate as uh, Procter and & Gamble and, and NASA are, are beginning to leverage the wisdom of the crowds uh, and, and prediction markets to A, both, uh, try to mitigate the, the effect of individual biases, but secondly, uh, extend the, the, the knowledge base to solve even highly technical questions. Um, I'm not sure. If, uh, my, my short answer to, to your question would be absolutely yes, we're excited about it. I think there's a lot of work still that needs to be done. And, and my only concern is if we look at so, some of the earliest antecedents to it and, and I'll admit there isn't a direct connection between the two, but um, some of the early work the Rand Corporation did in the 1950s uh, with what became the Delphi method in the 60s. And I know, you know Del Delphi has kind of fallen out of favor, but they did some exciting stuff for the first couple of decades. Um, I think it shows a, a lot of promise, but the downside is exactly like uh, for the reason that that Dell was trying to get away from humans altogether to reduce latency in the process, this might be in, 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 in practical terms, one of the important considerations for smaller organizations, how effectively could they really leverage prediction markets? Um, and, and again, uh, will the software requirements or, or other financial considerations in a small organization eliminate the cost benefit? But Overall, I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited about this as, 
as an additional uh, tool in the forecasting toolbox. That's Sorry, what was your name? I, I, I'd like to follow this up with you offline. That would be great. Yeah, my name is David Comerford, and I'm at the University of Stirling. So I have learned from this talk that you're on LinkedIn. Perhaps we can find each other that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Perfect. Thank you for your talk. As a behavioral economist, I was delighted to see you run through such a library of different biases so efficiently. So I yeah, can learn from well, that from my teaching. <laughs> time made it necessary. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate you uh, zooming in this morning. All right. Thanks for uh, facilitating me zooming in, Michael. Always a pleasure.